Today we would connect the design of a high entropy metal alloy to an Auflauf. Yes, you heard me right, an Auflauf. Well, we all know that an Auflauf is basically a dish made from leftover ingredients of the previous night. But how do we connect the two? Here comes the marvel of science slam. A starry-eyed man with curly white unkempt hair, unmindfully dressed, once jumped on a beam of light and rode on it. Now, we ride horses and motorbikes, but he jumped on a beam of light, probably with his tongue sticking out. There are prizes for guessing who this person is and what came off this ride. If only you could stamp your feet and make some noise. Aha! Well, the prize that I would get for such a crisp description that you all got in one shot is that each of you will buy me a beer after this. Well, as many of you have rightly guessed, Albert Einstein riding on a beam of light is one of the most fascinating science stories of the modern world, which is immensely sober than that of the ancient world. Now, what do we have there in the ancient world? In the city of Syracuse, which was then a part of ancient Greece, a man has just jumped out of the bathtub and is running stark naked on the streets. That was Archimedes, who had just cracked the code to find if the king's crown was made of pure gold or not, without having to destroy it. Archimedes had just given the world its Eureka moment. Well, to make science interesting to the audience, you don't always have to run naked on the streets. Though at times it may help. You see, we live in a world which is increasingly becoming connected. It hasn't become a global village as yet, but for instance, I am connected to about three global communities, and I'm sure that many of you are. And the knowledge that we have of the various aspects of the universe around us helps us in this universal citizenry. But how do we acquire or disseminate such scientific knowledge? How do you attract a complete heterogeneous set of people and make them listen to a science talk regarding, say, particle physics? Well, you can trick them by adding the word slam to it. So a science talk to a science slam. Now, that sounds cool. So the concept of science slamming is talking to a mixed set of people and elucidating them for 10 minutes over science without running naked on stage. It's a way of presenting the complex scientific research that one work, works on using simple words, metaphors, maybe with a little bit of humor, just like storytelling. And what kind of topics are covered in a science slam? Well, I have heard experts slamming on particle physics, representation of gender and equality in The Lion King, to the way enzymes work in our stomach, to the humorous effects of sex in Japanese anime. Looks like everything under the sun and Oops, even the solar system. At the end of a science slam, the audience decides the winner either with an applause or by holding a placard with a score on it. Now, where do science slams take place? Most of the time in regular Audimax auditoriums at a university. But, for example, there are other places too. 
I have slammed in auditoriums where a Brahms concert was held the previous evening. Once at an open-air theater next to a lake. I remember one slam, I was in a church. I was standing at the altar talking about science. And the other day at a discotheque, I was explaining metal physics at a discotheque. That was like walking on fire barefoot. <laughs> I had to be stronger than vodka, but tell you what, it was a challenge, but it was good fun. Now, not many people have heard about Alex uh, Drepper. You see, Alex came up with the concept of science slams. But before moving into Alex and science slamming, let me tell you how I got drawn into it. As I was growing up, I'm, I'm still growing up, I was always fascinated by the lectures of Richard Feynman and Neil deGrasse Tyson and how these great scientists and thinkers could communicate about the complex realities they worked on using simple words and metaphors. I still remember Richard Feynman's lectures in physics where he would talk about uh, thermodynamics and magnetism and he would just talk about two tennis balls bouncing around each other, talking about concepts at an atomic level. Richard Feynman still remains my guru in science communication. Let me give you another example over here, and this is from my textbook from my master's, which was incidentally written by my professor. So we were sitting around in class, and my professor comes up. He was trying to teach us the way layers of atoms move in a metal, in a stress scenario. And this is what he did. To your left, you have a caterpillar. Now, the way the caterpillar moves is by propagating a Mexican wave that moves through its body. To your right, you have a layer of atoms in a metal in a stress scenario, which are trying to move. And these layer of atoms just don't move at once. So as this Mexican wave propagates through the body of a caterpillar, and once the Mexican wave has finished, the caterpillar moves a distance. And so do the layer of atoms in a metal in a stress scenario. You know, relating these two concepts over here that is completely far apart, this was my wow moment. This was my epiphany, and I was hooked onto it for life. Now, coming back to Alex and science lands, um, Alex created the concept of science lands not far from here, Heidelberg and Darmstadt. And he made sure that science slams over here are represented by the disciples of the Feynmans of the world, like the one you are seeing before you right now. And the PhD students, professors, researchers, and all the Sheldons of the world can communicate about their area of expertise using simple words and metaphors. It's a way of, pro it's a way of propagating science beyond lab coats and safety glasses to grandparents, to shopkeepers, to musicians, to people in sports, to the Rachels and Joeys of the world, to everybody. Science Slam has started in a small way and has grown big. Two weeks back, I was in Wiesbaden, and there were 4,600 people in the audience listening to Science Slams and it is still growing. The result is phenomenal. Now, a student of music can understand the way enzymes work in the stomach and vice versa. And this makes sure that the transfer of knowledge is it's never oversimplified or misrepresented. Tell you what, which science slam is going to open a new window in your mind? You never know. Let me try a science slam over here, a short one, where we would try to create a high entropy metal alloy. Yeah? Are you ready? Let's go. Imagine it's a Sunday. 
Ah, it's not a Sunday. But imagine that it's a Sunday. And many of you would face a situation I face every damn Sunday. The curious case of an empty fridge. You would all agree with me. So since we face this situation, what we could do is we could take 20 grams of spaghetti sitting in one corner, 20 grams of schlagzana, 20 grams of mushrooms, 20 grams of cheese, almost equal amounts of carrots. You, you boil the spaghetti firstly, and then you put it in a bowl and you bake it, and you make the most delicious Auflauf ever, which is the English equivalent of a casserole. Now, the Auflauf is a very interesting dish because you're mixing five or more ingredients in almost equal amounts. And this is a very non-traditional way to prepare a dish. So let's take a very traditional dish over here, the spaghetti carbonara. Now, why is this traditional? Because in your spaghetti carbonara, you have one main component, which is your spaghetti. And other ingredients, like a little bit of ham, a little bit of cheese, maybe some mushrooms, I don't know. It's, that's weird. But all these small ingredients enhances the taste of the spaghetti. If you take chicken curry, your main component is your chicken, and a little bit of spices enhances the taste of this chicken. The Auflauf works in a completely different way. Now, you must be wondering, what the hell is this guy talking about? Well, I am a metallurgist working in material science, and you know what? Metallurgists have always designed metal alloys just like the spaghetti carbonara, where one element is an excess and other elements are added in small amounts to enhance the property of this one main element. Let's take an example. So let's create a metal alloy using the root of the spaghetti carbonara. We want to make something that is really strong, yeah? St steel, stahl. So what is your main component in steel or stahl? Loads of iron. And other elements are added in small amounts, like a little bit of manganese, a little bit of carbon to make it stronger, maybe a little bit of chromium to make it stainless steel that enhances the properties of this one main element. This is like a little bit of ham that enhances the properties of spaghetti and spaghetti carbonara. But what if we create or design an alloy just like an Auflauf? So let's take an example of designing a metal like the Auflauf. Let's take equal amounts of iron, equal amounts of nickel, almost equal amounts of cobalt, manganese, and chromium. Now, what would you call this metal over here? You cannot call it an iron alloy because nickel would go on strike saying that I am also present in equal amounts, hashtag equality. <laughs> well, as per the knowledge we have in the past five minutes, you can call this an Auflauf metal. <laughs> now, what drives an Auflauf metal over here? If we plot the randomness of the system versus the type of food, the spaghetti carbonara, the randomness is really low. What I mean is the probability in a spaghetti carbonara for the spaghetti to sit next to another spaghetti is pretty damn high. Now, if you take your Auflauf, the randomness is pretty high because the probability of a carrot sitting next to another carrot in your Auflauf is low. Now, if you're studying thermodynamics, you would know that randomness or increase of randomness, you can call it configurational entropy. So you can call your Auflauf a high entropy food. So the concept of high entropy is pretty new. It's, it's not been there for long. And uh, it's not going to be in your spoons and forks, but it's going to be used in very niche 
areas. For example, this particular off-loft alloy has shown excellent properties at very low temperatures where other metals have completely failed. Now, when you're making an off-loft, or when we are making an off loft metal, we want everything mixed together. We don't want this situation where iron and manganese are sitting in one corner loving each other and other elements are loving each other in another corner. We would call that precipitates or second phases. It's like when you're making an off loft and you're eating it with your partner, like you, you get all the fancy stuff like spaghetti and cheese and ham and so on, and your partner gets carrots, broccoli, and the not-so-interesting stuff. So when you're making an off-law, you want everything mixed together, and so does a high-entropy metal. And just like your off-law, if you don't like carrots, you can add broccoli. If you don't like tomato, you can add eggs to it. You can pick and choose the ingredients you want to match your tastes, and so goes for high-entropy metals. You can pick and choose atoms that you, you would want to sit over there in more or less equal amounts. Now, obviously, they follow certain scientific laws, but let's not get into pure science over here, but just understand the concept of high entropy metals. Now, since we are in Heidelberg, we all love equations or formulas, right? I was surprised by this, too. Do any of you know what this is? Where you see the ones in the box are more or less present in equal amounts. These are all the elements that make up a human body weighing about 70 kgs. This is what makes you. This is what makes me. You see, we are a single point on this high entropy system. You take selenium over there, you add an extra atom, we all die. You know, picking and choosing atoms, we can change the properties over here. So the next time you go to the kitchen, Open all the cupboards around you, everything around you. You take a dish and add everything around you to this dish in equal amounts. You're creating a high entropy food. And probably you have never created this in your life before. It may smell so good and it may taste so good that you hear a knock on the door and you open the door and there stands Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> so the next time, just open your computer, find out the closest science slam to your city, and visit it, and enjoy science. Thank you. <laughs>